God is good, isn't he? I'm telling you. We do have a good, good father. That's just who he is. He's good. God is good. James tells us about it. Yeah, God is good. We used to do it as uh, promise keepers. It was uh, God is good all the time. And then all the time, God is good. Yeah. That is so true, and that's what James tells us in the second chapter. By the way, you remember what he said about all good things come from above, uh, in which the, comes down from the Father of lights. Everybody say, that's our God. All good and perfect things come down from the Father of lights, and with whom there is no variableness or shadow of turning, which means... God doesn't, God doesn't vary one, one degree of shadow in what he does. God's not two-faced. God's not fickled. God's not confused. He's not going to stab you in the back, leading you one way, and then all of a sudden, boom, change the rules on you because it's the nature of God to give, right? Just like it's the nature of light to give light. It's the nature of heat to produce heat. I mean, you don't have to convince light to produce light. That's what light is. You don't produce heat to produce heat. Heat is. You don't have to try to, uh, to uh, encourage God to give because God is giving. You know, he gave himself. So anyway, praise the Lord. Uh, if you're visiting with us, I, I, I neglect to do this from time to time, uh, almost every week. If you're if you're first-time guest with us, if you'll lift your hand, Brother Charles got some stuff here. Keith has some stuff. Do I see any first-timers out here? I'm not seeing any first-timers. I see some second and third-timers and all that. By the second or third time you come in, you're pretty much with us. You know, we probably, we don't consider you a, a, a part. People, people have asked, how do I join the church? Uh, well, you come. If you come, you're a member. If you don't come, you're not a member. I mean, that's pretty much the way it is. We, we don't have like a, an official role because I have pastored churches. I'm serious now, and I mean, I'm not, I'm not shooting at you guys. But uh, it's the nature of people. It's just crazy. I've pastored churches that had 850 members. Of course, the FBI couldn't find half of them uh, at any given time. Uh, the problem was looking for some of them. That's probably why they weren't there, you know. But, uh, but it's just funny how people, they'll come and join up to something and stay about two or three weeks, and then they'll be gone. Nobody ever sees them again. But their name stays on some roll somewhere as yeah. if that's real, as if somehow that's going to get you into the kingdom of God. That your name, like first thing Jesus is going to do when you stand before him one day, uh, should you be called up in the rapture, which is the judgment seat of Christ in 1 Corinthians 3, by the way, and I'm going to get off on that, and I don't want to do it. But let me just tell you, there are two judgments. One of them is the judgment seat of Christ, and only Christians will stand there. So if you're not a Christian, you'll never stand at the judgment seat of Christ. The other is the great white throne judgment in the book of Revelation where only lost people stand. If you find yourself at the great white throne, you can go, uh-oh, I'm gone. Because it says, and the dead, both great and small, stand before the throne. So if, if it's the dead people, dead spiritually and dead physically. It's those that don't know the Lord, that don't have Christ living in your heart. Only lost people stand at the great white throne, and only saved people stand at the judgment seat of Christ. The judgment seat of Christ is like an Olympic judge stand. You're not judged as to whether you're lost or saved. You're judged as to what you have done with what God has given you to do with. And your life stands before the Lord and you get a 9.1, 5.2, 7.8, 9.9. And then you receive crowns, the crown of life, the martyr's crown, the crown of of teaching. There are five of them that are mentioned in the Bible. and, And you get one based on all that has happened, the works that have happened in your Christian life, and you're not judged like, you're not judged based on what God wanted me to do and the gifts God gave me. You're judged on what gifts he gave you. So I'm not the standard by which you're judged, neither are you the standard by which I'm judged. What God does is look at our life and say, I've given you this much stuff, and what have you done with what I've given you to do with? And then he gives you the crown, and believe it or not, because we're so carnal and, and we're so self-centered on this side of heaven, this probably doesn't mean anything to us. But one day when we stand in the presence of God, the only thing that will matter to us is how much do I have to lay before Jesus? 
It'll be the joy of my life won't be how much do I get. It'll be how much can I lay before Christ. That's because I love him and I, I worship him and I honor him. And, and if I have one crown, fine, which all of you will have one crown. It's the crown of life. It's the crown you get when you, Christ comes to live in your life, which if you don't have that one, you're not even standing before this throne. You're not, you know, you're going to be in that other line at the other end where Jesus looks at you and you're going to say, well, Lord, didn't I do miracles? Lord, I didn't. And I cast out demons, all of that in your name. And he's going to look at you and say, depart from me, you worker of sin, for I never. He said, I never knew you. He didn't say, I knew you once and you got away. I knew you back then, but you lived such a horrible life, you got yourself out of heaven. No, he said, I never have known you. You didn't have it from the start. You, 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 know, you missed it from the very start. I never knew you. And so uh, I'm just encouraging you to be real. And how did I get off on this? I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I'm preaching out of James, but that's in Corinthians. So, yeah, that's first, that's first Corinthians chapter three. I'm talking about right there. Holy smokes, Lord, what are you doing? You know, I every, it's so funny because every time I ask him about stuff like that. And I know some of you think, oh, you're so crazy because you talk about talking to the Lord and asking him stuff and all that. And, you, and you're wondering, I know you're wondering, well, if you ask him, how does he talk to you? You know, well, he talks to me just like he talks to you. I mean, I know some of, you know, you hear this phrase all the time from Christians, especially in testimonies. They'll say, and the Lord spoke to me, yeah. or the Lord spoke to my heart, or yeah. God said this. Yeah. And you say, man, how does that happen? What Does he just like whisper in your ear or does he... Does he just come through the window pane or something like that? And no, no, the Lord just impresses in here. It, it, it's that still, small voice. You know, uh, uh, what's it, Elijah or Elisha? I can't, you know, these guys, when I get to heaven one day, I'm, I've already told you, I'm going to have to have a talk with these guys because uh, the, the Elisha and Elijah, that's just too close. You get them mixed together. You say, Elisha did this or Elijah did this. But, but anyway, uh, one of these cats uh, uh, was in a cave and they said, uh, and said uh, man, I, 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 listened, you know, I listened to the fire and God was not in the fire. And I listened to the wind and God was not in the mighty wind. And he said, then God spoke in a still, small voice. So God wasn't in the blundering, powerful uh, 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 utilities of life. God was in that little tender, small something that was almost in, internal, you know, just still small voice. And I'm just saying that that's the way God speaks uh, many times. He, he just, it's that, it's that still inside of you. It's that, it's that observation thing inside of you. It's that, oh, have you considered this inside of you? And you all have this. And sometimes my wife says it. She's the voice of God. Sometimes it's uh, my children, my grandchildren. Sometimes it's the TV. Sometimes it's, you know, I'm not sure Jake, our dog, ever speaks a word from God, but... <laughs> But, but he would want to, you know, he thinks he is, he thinks he's a human, but, but anyway, but I'm just saying that, uh, these words come as impressions. They come as, uh, revelations, you know, oh my goodness, I never thought of that. And, and God leads and, and, and then he, you know, when I stand up here, here I go off <laughs> rambling out on something and it's not even about James, you know, in the last song, it talked about good, good father. And, and I'm, and I'm just saying God is good. And then. James, James said God was good in chapter 2. He said, man, you know, uh, everything good that, hap that, that happens in life comes from God. He says, look, get this straight. Uh, and, and here's just an encouragement, and then I'm, I promise you I'm getting in this because this is really some good stuff today uh, out of chapter 4, some stuff we really need. Uh, but James said, uh, get this straight because evidently what was happening is James was saying, to, the, to this group of Christians here, uh, uh, God carries you through trials. Yeah. And these trials can be painful. And they can be not fun. But they're not sinful. They're not wrong. They don't lead you to something wrong. They don't encourage you to do wrong. They are encouragements to achieve. There are opportunities to move forward. There are opportunities to be, become more mature, to grow, to experience something that's going to make you 
a better person, a more a powerful person, a, a, a more stable person, a mature person in life. And going into this, if you will know this, then you can count it joy when you fall into one of these various trials. And then somebody jumped up evidently and said, well, James, I'm not being tried by God. I'm being tempted by God. And James said, man, don't even say stupid stuff like that. He said, that's ridiculous. God doesn't tempt people. Yeah. And here's his reasoning. Because God can't be tempted. God can't be tempted. So he doesn't tempt you because it's not the nature of God to be tempted. So God is as far from tempting you as temptation is from himself so what God does is God gives only good stuff, and it comes down from the Father of lights. Read it in chapter 2. It says it exactly like this, uh, with whom there's no variableness or degree of turning. So he, he says that when God gives you something, it is always good. Look at your neighbor and say, not always pleasant, <laughs> but always good. Uh, I mean, it's not always pleasant, as opposed to being sinful. It's yeah. never sinful. It's never encouraging you to sin. It's never carrying you to the opportunity to rebel against God or sin. But it, it might be challenging because sometimes our life is in a painful place and getting you out may cause pain. Yeah, and, and it's that kind of thing where you say, whoo, I never want to do that again. Yeah. Yeah, and James says, all right, well, remember that. Put that in your memory bank. Put it in your soul. Let it go forward, and don't make those dumb choices again. What is the definition of insanity? To continue to do the same thing and expect different results. You're looking at me, and you're saying, man, my life is falling apart. Well, are you still doing the same thing you did last month? Well, well, then what do you expect? You expect, okay, I'm going to keep doing the same dumb things, and somehow the, 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 the world, universe, uh, uh, the parameters of God, whatever you might want, are going to just change all of a sudden, and I can still do the same ignorant things and start getting a better result out of that. No, you keep doing them, you're going to keep getting the same results over and over and over. Say, my life's falling apart. All right, change. Man, I, I can't get any money. I can't get ahead. All right, well, change. Quit spending everything and buying everything your beady little eyes see at Walmart. Yeah, yeah. I mean, come on. Hey, it's just that simple, really. It's just that simple. So James says, uh, God only brings good stuff. So don't ever be tempted to think. I mean, really, this is what he's saying. Don't ever be tempted to think. That when God brings something into your life, that he's punishing you, that he's, he wants you to suffer, and that he's mad at you, so he's letting bad things come, because God only gives good things. Yeah. May not pleasant all the time, but good. Yeah, he wants the best for us. He does. And so that's the James, that's the essence. So then chapter 3 said, beware of this little organ in your mouth because it has a tremendous power. It has the power to direct your life like a horse's bit in a rudder of a ship. Get the stuff, you'll hear all about that. And it does because life and death are in the power of the tongue. Yeah. That's what Solomon tells us in the book of Proverbs, life and death. I have an opportunity to speak with my tongue Words that give life, and I have the opportunity to speak with my tongue words that bring death. When I say yes, it, something goes forth, and it, it produces either life or death. When I say no, when I say guilty, when I say not guilty, when I say yes, you may, or no, you can't, or go this way, or stop that, these are words that come out of my mouth, and they are directing those that I have the power over to direct. And the tongue destroys. It's like a fire. It's like poison. It's like, it's like a, a, a wild animal. I mean, you, 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 tame, you tame fire, and fire becomes your friend. It becomes your helper. It becomes a friendly force. But when fire is out of control, it burns the world down, right? 
You know, ask the people out in California and Nevada and Colorado and, and we're Arizona. I mean, ask those people, man, when that fire gets out of control, it just destroys everything. But under control, it heats your food, it warms your home, it does gives light. I mean, it's a wonderful helper when it's under control, but it's, it'll kill you if it gets out of control. And, and the tongue is like a, a wild animal, which when they're tamed, they're wonderful helpers, camels and horses and elephants and animals that are beasts of burdens and, 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 and dogs and friends. I mean, when these animals, these wild animals are tamed, then they become helpers to us and not enemies of us. But if they're wild, they can eat us up and trample us and destroy us and, and all of that kind of stuff. And then poison, man, poison is wonderful when it's under control. Probably about 99% of all the medicines we take are poison. They will kill us if, we, if it's not in the right milligram dosage and all that kind of stuff. I mean, cancer drugs, all they do is kill our body. They just kill controlled areas of our body and certain cells in our body, but they kill it. But if you, if you get too big of a dosage here or too much of a thing, then all of a sudden this poison that was under control is out of control, and one little drop of it will kill everybody in this building. But under control, it's a wonderful friend and a great helper, and it heals our body, and it takes away bad stuff. So James says the tongue is like a fire, like a poison, like a wild animal. It has the power to destroy your life or to bless your life one way or the other. And then he said the tongue can be delightful. It's a fountain. It's fig trees. It's, you know, it's a wonderful blesser of life because life and death is in the power of the tongue. So there you go, you know. God is good. God is helpful. God it carries us through storms. If you're, a, if you're a Christian, you go through things and you keep on moving through things. If you're a Christian, you practice what you preach. You stand there like a man or a woman of God and go through the issues of life because the Holy Spirit is empowering you. And you watch your tongue and you say things and you remember and you keep that tongue under control and you ask the Holy Spirit because no man can tame the tongue. Only God can tame the tongue. He didn't say the tongue couldn't be tamed. He just says no man can tame the tongue. So you have to have the Holy Spirit living inside of you to, to control what this little two-ounce muscular mucus membrane fella here in my mouth flouts all the time. That's why God put it behind bars, you know, these ivory bars. He put, he put this old flapper behind ivory bars like it's in prison so it can't talk. And put it in this deep cave so it's out of sight and hopefully out of mind. He, then he bathes it in this mucous membrane to cool it down because the Bible says the tongue is a fire and it is set on fire of hell. So God does everything he can to keep this little deal under control. And then he says, listen, be quick to listen and slow to speak. And then you'll be, then you'll be slow to wrath. In other words, listen twice as much as you talk. Because every time you talk, usually bad stuff starts happening. Yeah. And the more you talk, the worse it gets. So there you go. Praise the Lord. All right. That's it in a nutshell. Let's look at chapter, chapter 4. All right. Now, I've only got like 10 minutes to look at chapter 4, which is typical. Let me carry it to you quickly. All right. Here we go. James in chapter 4 begins a whole new little deal. Uh, James becomes a church analyst. You, do you know what a church analyst is? It's just like an analyst in your job. Uh, by the way, are you guys hot? Yes. Okay, I, look, look, I mean, let me take a time out for just a second. We have a thermostat that's behind this new structure up here, and what we're doing is... Uh, because it's behind a new structure, it doesn't, it doesn't stay in the flow like it usually does. So we're trying to figure out how can we, how low does that, does that thermostat have to be to make it comfortable for you guys out here? So it was on 70, now it's on 68. So that's really about six degrees colder than we used to run it before that wall got put there a couple of weeks ago. So just bear with us. If you start freezing, I start seeing you turn blue and teeth chattering. 
I'll try to stop again, okay, because I, I want you to be comfortable as you possibly can because the Lord makes it as uncomfortable a lot of times anyway. So we need to be, I'd like physically for you to be at least as comfortable as you can be. All right, so here we go. So chapter four, James now becomes a church analyst. And a church analyst is somebody literally who comes into a church and watches how the church operates and talks to the pastors and the leaders and observes what the church does and so forth. And so James comes to some church somewhere. Now, I'm telling you this because you're going to have to be reminded as, as when, when we go through this chapter, which we are, we're going through every verse and it is something else. Believe me, what he says to these people. And you're going to have to be reminded he's talking to a church. You know, because you're going to have the tendency to say, no, man, these, this couldn't be a church. <laughs> these got to be lost people, man. I mean, well, look what he's saying to them. And, and, and yet, no, he's talking to a church, some church, somewhere. The church is not identified. It might be the church he pastors. It might be the one next door. I don't know who it is. He's never identified who he's talking to, but it is a church somewhere. And notice how he starts off talking to this church. Where do wars and fights come from among you? Now, isn't that an interesting one? Where is all this warring and fighting coming from that I'm seeing in these business meetings? Where's all this warring and fighting I'm seeing in the services that you're having? It looks like you got sides, half of you are one way and half. I mean, where does this come from? Uh, do they not come from your desires for pleasure that war in your members? I mean, isn't it because each of you have a way and you're all trying to get your way and your way is different from somebody else's way and so you fight for your way and they fight for their way and it's a mess, man. And, and he goes on to say, you lust and you do not have. Look, these are words he's telling church. Boy, they must have had some interesting business meetings. Look at that. You lust and you do not have. You murder and you covet and you cannot obtain. You fight and you war. You see what I'm talking about? Yeah. This is a church. These are brothers and sisters like you're in a congregation right now. Imagine being in a church like this. Imagine when you go to church, there's this animosity, there's this resentment, this hostility in church. Imagine going to church and it's this side against this side. And when you look across over there, you look and you snarl and you, and you, you hiss and you get angry and you say, those reprobates over there, don't you? I mean, imagine this. This is a church, and this is what James says. James says, you, you, you fight and you war, man. You have not because you ask not. And you ask and you do not receive because you ask amiss that you might spend it on your own pleasure. So James, the great church analyst, comes in, and James says, all right, um, I've, I've spent some time examining you, and, and, and here's your problem. Here, here's, here's your problem. You have not because you ask not, and you ask and don't get it. You receive not because you're asking it for the wrong reasons that you might consume it on yourself. So thus, this is a dead church. Everybody say dead church. This is a church where you would not sense the Spirit of God. This is a church that you would go into and you would be repulsed. If you're led by the Spirit of God, the Spirit in you would, would, would sense a rebellion and sense a wall there. It's a dead church. And James says, you have not, you ask not, and you receive not. Hence, three knots on a dead log. Okay? The name, three knots on a dead church log is what it boils down to. So James says, all right, we're going we're gonna to do it this way. And so I'm saying to you, here's how we're going to look at it. Uh, there are two, this chapter has, two, has a division. And the first six verses of this chapter give us the symptoms of the problem. There are four things that James says in these six verses that show us that we are a dead log that you are not getting it, that your life is not real with Christ, that you are producing death and not life. You are a not on a dead log. And then beginning at verse 7 through 17, he says, all right, here's what you do about it. 
So we're going to look at it that way, okay? And, and I'm going to give you just uh, hopefully all three of these, but maybe, maybe not. But anyway, all right, I'm not going to do the whole chapter, so relax, everybody. I know that. I know I'm not, I'm not going to get through the whole deal. Didn't plan to. Mm-hmm. Because, listen, I'm telling you, uh, this, is, this is stuff you want to know. I mean, this is, this is James saying, good night, man. You need to see this about yourself because this really, this is about your church. This is about you. This is about your relationship with other Christians and what happens in life, man. These are your brothers and sisters. This is what you need to know in life. And so here comes James, and James says, all right, uh, I'm going to give you the symptoms of a problem first, the symptoms that you are a not on a dead log. All right, here is symptom number one. Symptom number one is my life can be described by what I am not rather than what I am. He says, all right, if your life can be better described by what you do not have rather than what you do have, then you are a knot on a dead log. In other words, these were possessionless people. When James looks at them, the first thing he says is, you know what I notice about you? I notice that you don't have anything. I notice that you are a bunch of have-nots. It's obvious. It's right out there in front. Man, if anybody asks me what kind of church is that down there and what kind of people are those down there, the way I would start describing them is they're not peaceful, they're not joyful, they're not powerful with God, they don't, they don't possess the Holy Spirit. I would begin describing you by what you don't have rather than what you do have. So if your life, and I want you to think about it, if somebody was describing you to someone else that didn't know you, how would they describe you? Would they describe you better by what you are not? Well, he's not very patient. Um, not, he doesn't, he's not very loving. Um, man, they doesn't have a level head. They'll fly off at the heartbeat. I mean, you got to be careful. They're not gracious. They're not meek. Uh, they're not happy. I've never seen them smile in their entire... I mean, would people... Would, would you be described better by what you are not rather than what you are? And James, the first thing James says is... Um, uh, the first thing I notice is that you're a bunch of people that that you, 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 you seek and you desire to have and you cannot obtain, but you have not because you ask not. So uh, you have not. Now, whether you know this or not, this is an indictment. I mean, for James to say, I, when I look at you, I think of what you don't have. That's an indictment. Because you remember back in chapter 2, as a matter of fact, I mean, chapter 1, I brought this verse back for you so you can see. You remember back in chapter 1 what James says that the reason you can be joyful when you have to suffer because it does something to you? And here's what it does, verse 4 of chapter 1. Look at what it says. But let patient ha patience have its perfect work that you may be perfect and complete, lacking what? Nothing. Nothing. All right, so James says, look, the reason we're joyful when we go through trials is that trials do something to us. Yeah. Trials grow us up. Trials perfect us. That, that verse literally says, but lay, let patience have its perfecting work. We, look at your neighbor and say, you're not perfect, and I'm not perfect. Okay, so we're not talking about perfection here on this earth. We're not talking about the fact that I could be perfect. But it does mean that I'm moving toward perfection. And it does mean that patience has a way of maturing you. So the reason we go through trials joyfully is so that patience can mature us. Sometimes our faith is green. Sometimes we need to be ripened in the Spirit of God. And so James says our life should be described as one that is moving toward being mature and perfect in life and that we should every day every moment be growing toward and people should be able to recognize this and see this my life ought to be filled with more of christ more of joy more of love more of peace more of long suffering more of gentleness more of faith more of meekness self-control temperance i mean that my life now should be 
closer to that than it ever has been. And tomorrow it'll be closer than it ever has been. And the next day it'll be closer than it ever has been because God wants to me to be complete and lack nothing. And so because James can look at a bunch and say, I can describe you by what you don't have rather than what you do have, you are lacking a lot. So this is an indictment against you. I'm saying that you are better described by, by your lack, and God doesn't want you to lack anything. And he's bringing, he's bringing all these things into your life to make sure you don't lack so what's wrong? Yeah, yeah, you, 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 you are a possessionless person. You, you don't have and, and you, don't, you don't seem to be going anywhere. And so here's what, here's what Paul said to the Ephesians. I'm just going to show you some things that could be lacking. Y'all doing all right? Okay, all right. Look at what Paul said to them, all right? This is Paul talking to a church in Ephesus, and just look at what he says to them. But speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things unto him who is the head, Christ, from whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies, according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. Now, I can see some of you look confused. You say, man, that's a mouthful. What is that all about? Well, the Apostle Paul is saying in this verse, and now I'm going to explain it, and you can just look at it. I'm going to leave it up there so you can see if I'm telling you the truth. All right, the Apostle Paul says what the Holy Spirit does is that inside every one of us, when we come to the Lord, God calls us to something. And when he calls us to something, he puts gifts on the inside of us so that we can accomplish that which he calls us to. That's why we have one journey class that deals nothing with but the gifts of the Spirit so you can see what you are called to do. And you can tell this by the way you're gifted. Your gifts show you what he intends for you to do because those are the ones he gave you. And it says, do it this way. It would be like if I drove up out in front of your house and I put out some sheetrock and I put out some two-by-fours and I put out some tape uh, uh, and some joint tape and I put out some mud. Uh, what would you assume? You would assume I'm about to build a little drywall in your house somewhere, right? When you see all that pile of stuff, you wouldn't say, I've come to put electricity in your house. <laughs> because those are not electrical things. Those are drywall things. So I'm just saying... If God ha brings a bunch of electrical cords and, and, and power outlets and all that, then he intends for you to be an electrician. If he brings uh, drywall and lumber, and so he intends you to be a carpenter. See, I, I mean, this is compare that to gifts, all right? Just use that as an analogy. And that's how you can tell what God wants you to do. You say, man, what does God want me to do? Well, how has he gifted you? Yeah, what are you good at? What is it that you do when you do it? You love it and others are blessed by it. I mean, it can be just as simple as that. <laughs> Good night. But anyway, this verse says but God does that. And so every one of us are part of the body. Somebody's a hand. Somebody's a forearm. Somebody's an upper arm. Somebody's a shoulder cap. Somebody's a chest. Somebody's a finger. Somebody's a mouth. Somebody's an eye. And so every one of us make up a whole body. And each one of us has certain work to do in that body so that the body moves right, functions right, can reach out, not only see things, but can reach out and grab it and bring it back, can walk to do the will of God, can move. Where I mean, this church is a big body full of all kinds of parts. And what are you? Are you a finger or a joint or an arm? And so uh, Paul, Paul's telling the church in, in Ephesians that, that, that the Holy Spirit creates this body, and every joint in this body is supposed to do what, is, what it is called to do so that this body continues to grow and continues to love and continues to minister. And, and so this body is intended to produce something that's going to be usable by God in life. And what James is saying is, man, you guys need a Holy Ghost chiropractor to come in here and pop this body back into shape because some of these bones are out of whack and these joints need to be tuned up and all of that kind of stuff because you are certainly not a body of Christ. 
And so the dead church probably receives this report, and because I'm used to pastoring churches, they probably had a committee meeting. They probably had a meeting, a business meeting. And they probably elected a committee off the floor. Didn't he, Miss Bell? You, you used to that, you and Lark, yeah. They, they, they had a big meeting, and they said, all right, we're going we're gonna to get us a committee because we just had a report from this guy that came in and did this church analysis. And you know what he said? He said, we're a bunch of have-nots. Whenever we, 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 we're not getting what we deserve. We are possessionless people. We, and I don't know about you, but I want to get everything God has for me. Is that right? And everybody went, amen. amen. And that was a great shout. And so they said, brother so-and-so, you're on the committee, sister so-and-so, amen. Brother so-and-so, amen. And they probably put seven or eight people on the committee. And now you've got to have an odd number because they always fight against each other. So you've got, you got to have an odd number so somebody will win. Nine or 12, 11. They put all these people on the committee, and here's what they said. They said, we charge you to study our church, and we want you to come back, and we want you to report to the church why we don't have. Because the brother over here just said, we don't have. A bunch of stuff. We're a have-nots. So why don't we have? And the committee went out, and the committee came back with all kinds of, of reasons why they don't have. Well, we don't have the right location. If we were out on the highway where everybody could see us instead of in this little back country road, man, we could have our building full of people because people can't see us. We just got the right, wrong location. And then somebody else said, well, we need bigger buildings, man, and more, and more influential looking places because when people drive up, they see this little squatty hole in the wall and they don't want to go to church there. But if we had a brand new sanctuary and brand new big buildings, man, we could really be something. And then somebody else probably said, yeah, and we need some more givers too. We need some. We don't have enough offering. Our people sit out here, and our offering. Uh, they, people don't. People don't tithe. People don't don't do right. And we we have a bunch of poor people in our church. We have a bunch of blue collar workers. They make, uh, you know, ten dollars, fifteen dollars, twenty dollars an hour. We need some professionals. We need some doctors and some lawyers. We need some people that make money hand over fist. And we need. And if we had some big professionals, and we had big givers, and we had the right location, and we had the, the right, you know, the right opportunities and the right looking building, then man, we could really, we could really be something. And then James comes back with that. No, you have not because you're not functioning like a body of Christ. You have not. And it's an indictment against the church not because you don't have the right location, not because you don't have big enough facilities, not because you don't have big givers and professional people in your church. You, have, you, you need the Holy Ghost to snap you out of this thing and snap you into it because God intends for your body to be a functioning, moving body, all of it moving at the same time in the same direction. Let me give you something else. Yeah, I mean, this is Jesus speaking. Now, look at this. Now, I'm just trying to show you and I hope, I hope you're getting this. I'm trying to show you what God says a Christian life should be. See, this is, this is an indictment. I said when James says you are known by what you don't have rather than what you do have, that is an indictment against you. Because, this, because God intends for your life to be totally different from that. God intends for your life to be properly adjusted and moving and walking and manifesting the Spirit of God and accomplishing the things of God. That's his intention according to Ephesians. And then in John, look at what Jesus said. Now, Jesus answered, this is the woman at the well. Look at what he said. Jesus answered and said to her, whoever drinks of this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. But the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. What was Jesus identifying there? Wasn't Jesus saying when Christ comes in you, it brings perfect satisfaction? Doesn't he say that? I mean, doesn't he, doesn't he say, look, you can drink of the water of this world and you're going to get thirsty again. You can drink the water of this world and you're not, it's not going to satisfy you, but you let, 
You, you receive what I'm saying, you drink my water, and you'll never be thirsty again. What does that imply? That implies that when I receive Christ, my life becomes satisfied. So he's talking about perfect satisfaction in life. Let me, let me, let me show you another word. <laughs> yeah, Paul to these Philippians, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. What is Paul saying we should have as Christians? That we should have a peace that blows our mind. We should have a peace that goes way past what we could understand. So Paul tells the, Jesus tells the, 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 the woman at the well, I'm going to give you perfect satisfaction. Paul tells the Ephesians, God wants you to have perfect peace in life. And then here comes Jesus again. Behold, this is when he tells his disciples, he's going back to heaven and he's going to send the Holy Spirit back to them so they won't be alone. And this is the end of that conversation. Behold, I send you the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. So what is, what is Jesus saying about the Christian life that we are to be endued with power from the Holy Spirit? What does that mean? It means I walk with Christ. I should have sufficient power in my life. And look, look, look put it all together. Put, put it all together. What, what is it? All right, uh, if our life is full of God, we ought, to have, uh, we, ought to be, we ought to have perfect satisfaction. We ought to have perfect peace. And we ought to have sufficient power in life. And we should be moving in a positive direction. And I submit to you today that most churches don't have power. Most churches don't have peace. Most churches don't walk together. Most churches don't manifest the glory of God. They're a bunch of have-nots. And it's an indictment against them. And James says, I'm, I'm telling you what your problem is. Your problem is you don't have joy. You don't have peace. You don't have gentleness. You don't have strength. You don't have power. You, your, your life is described by what you don't have. Thomas Aquinas, and I know you've heard that name before. Thomas Aquinas was a Catholic uh, theologian in the 1200s. So that eliminates a lot of us, you know. <laughs> but listen to what he said. I, I just want you to hear what he said. He was a Catholic. Now, he was also a great philosopher back then, a theologian and philosopher. Look him up. Type Thomas Aquinas, and you'll be shocked at how, how many sayings and different things he said. But, but, but. He, he was taken by the Pope at that time, who was in, named Pope Innocent II. What a name, Innocent II. And he was taken to uh, Rome to, to look in the, in the great Roman church, and, and the, the Pope laid before him uh, silver and gold, just spread it all out on the table. It was giant, big table, and it was just bunches of gold and silver and receipts and all that kind of stuff. And the Pope looked at Thomas Aquinas, and the Pope said to Thomas, uh, well, the church can no longer say silver and gold, have I none? And Thomas looked back at him and said, yes, and neither can it say in the name of Jesus, rise, take up your bed and walk. See, the church is to be identified, our life is to be identified, not by what we, we obtain in the world, but by the gifts and the abilities that Christ gives us to reflect him in this world we live in. And I'm just asking you, how is your life described? Are you described more by what you don't have than what you do have? You might be a knot on a dead log. That's what James says. Have nots. So I got to quit. Sorry. There are two more of these. Uh, three, actually. Three, actually. So we all be here next week? All right. That's a little hard, isn't it? A little harsh on you. Stand, stand. Your feet.